Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, well, as I said, last week's message was kind of a reminder that God has a plan. He actually has a plan. Um, without a plan, everyone does their own thing, and it can quickly become a, a jumbled mess. Uh, no workplace ever says, uh, eh, just do whatever you feel like, right? Just you do what you want. Don't listen to what I say. Don't listen to the higher-ups. Just do your thing. No coach says that either, right? He doesn't say, well, go do whatever you feel like. Play whatever position you want. And, uh, I mean, may maybe you've had a, a teacher or a boss or someone like that who, who really is kind of clueless and doesn't give very good instructions or how to get there. And if you have, you've probably been pretty frustrated uh, because without direction, schools, community, businesses they tend to fall apart. But thankfully, God does have a plan. He's got a plan to get us from point A to point B, and uh, he, he knows. He knows how to transform this world. He knows how to transform our church. He knows how to transform our own lives. And it's good to know that somebody knows uh, what's going on. He knows how to change our lives from broken and falling apart um, to... Uh, put together and, and fully functioning. Um, and our reading from 1 Thessalonians gave us some of those details. So uh, let's jump into the reading. We're going to go back a couple verses before our reading, um, and we'll have those verses on the screen for you here. It says, Since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. Well, it starts off by saying, be sober, which includes alcohol, uh, but it isn't limited to alcohol overconsumption. Being sober-minded is about being, well, under control, right? And that's pretty key for, for life. And again, I'm trying to, it helps me, hopefully it'll help you or connect anyway, to think about it from the angle of sports as applying it, but it applies to, to the rest of life too. It's definitely true for sports that you want to be under control. It's good to have energy and hustle and movement. You really want that. But if you're not under control, you're just going to be flying everywhere. And, you know, you're, if you're dribbling too fast with the basketball, the faster than you can actually do it, you're going to lose it. You're going to turn the ball over. If you're out of control on defense and you're not in a, a actual, in a good defensive position, well, any good offensive player is just kind of going to glide by you on their way to the hoop. Um, so too in life. If we're just flying around by the seat of our pants, it's really hard to accomplish anything. If, if, it's, if, if we are spending our time now thinking about the sober, you know, like being under control, if you're spending all your time and all your energy and focus just thinking about how am I going to feel good? How am I going to have the next high? Whatever, it may be something that's not even bad in and of itself, but if, it's our, if we're always driven just by what feels good or what we want to do next, uh, without having a, 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 a greater plan, um, well, then you're not really under control anymore. You're under the influence. Even if it's not under the influence of drugs, it's under the influence of something. Something else is influencing you and controlling you and not yourself. Um, and we don't want to be under the influence. We want to be under control uh, now, I can't really say this is 100% like, you know, a Bible verse that I can point to, but I think this, this is, it, it's true nonetheless. In 99% of cases, I just kind of made that number up, so don't take that to the bank. But in 99 cases, if you're out of control, 99% uh, of cases, if you're, if you're out of control, then there's somebody who can bring you back into control, right? And it's, it's, just, it's the shocker, if you've lost self-control, then you need to get self back in control. Right? Now, now, admittedly, there's certainly sometimes self-control, maybe we certainly need help, um, but even when, even when it's a cry for help, you've got to be the one that makes that cry for help. And 
that's, again, it kind of relates back to being under control, being sober-minded, and that's what Paul wants us to do. Um, in fact, we are in charge. We are stewards of our body. We're in charge. Nobody else is moving my hand but me. I'm making my vocal cords move. No one else is, is doing that. And there's certainly a way in which Christians, were, you know, we can't, just because we're under some control doesn't mean we control everything, right? And that's not what I'm trying to say. But we have to be, you know, no one else is going to take control of my body but me, right? So uh, we have to be in control of ourselves so that we can do what we, we need to do. Again, if you're playing in a particular sport, you've got to be under control so you, can, you have a task that you want to accomplish and you need to be able to go do it. So too in our, in our Christian walk, we, gotta, we, have, we may have goals and things we want to do, but if we're not under control, we're probably not going to have a lot of luck getting there. Um, so it's important to not let somebody else or some other thing drag you around, but uh, be in control of yourself. And again, I think a, probably a Christian perspective on that would be that sometimes we need to repent, sometimes we need to ask for help, but those may be the key steps to kind of getting things back under control so we're not out of control. Another part of the game plan is uh, encouragement. Um, then Paul says, encourage one another as in fact you are already doing. Now, as a, a coach, uh, you know, again, I'm, it's hard for me not to think of this as, you know, I, an amateur coach of our a basketball, community basketball team here. As a coach, I can't only be telling people what they're doing wrong. Um, I can't just harp on the things that they're doing wrong. People also, players also need to be told what they're doing right. Because if they, they're doing something right and they're never told, uh, they might start to think, well, maybe this isn't right. right? We, need, we need, and as a church, we, all of us, are the same kind of boat. We need encouragement. We need affirmation. Hey, that this is a good thing, um, that, that I'm, I'm doing the right thing. And Paul says, encourage those who are timid. Again, I, it's easy for me to think of this in sports because you've got different kinds of players. Every team probably has a variety of players, just like every church has a variety of, of personalities. Now, some basketball players are, are energetic and exciting, and they're all over, um, and that's good, but they need to be a little, what they need to do is work on being a little bit more deliberate, like kind of, we were talking about being under control. Some people need to be encouraged to be to slow down just a minute and make sure you're thinking about what you're doing. On the other hand, some people need to be encouraged uh, because they're a little tentative. They're, they're afraid to do the next thing. And sometimes we need to, and they're maybe very capable, but they're just not quite sure if they should do it. And they might need, and that's where Paul's talking about uh, encouraging people. Um, as a basketball player, you know, you. I, you, you, you don't want somebody who's afraid to do anything on the basketball court. Now, everybody, when you're learning, you kind of start off that way, or most, most people. Some people are just ready. They may be no good at all, but they're just ready to play anyway. But most people, if they're not good, they kind of sense it, and they're, they're a little timid. But as you learn, you get better. And, and again, you, as a coach, you don't want somebody out there who's afraid to do anything because you're not really going to get anything accomplished. You, so even some players are afraid to shoot the ball, and you just say to some, even if you think they might miss, you say, you have a good shot, you need to take it. We need you doing something productive. And you know, maybe even if you miss the first couple, eventually you're going to get the hang of it. And that's what we need as a church. So we need to, we got to encourage each other. Hey, no, you can do this. Don't, don't be uh, afraid to do this. Uh, we, so um, that's another thing that Paul's encouraging us as a body, as a team, um, to be doing. Um, uh, like, now having said that, we need to encourage each other, but just like any other workplace or team, there also needs to be some correction. And uh, that's why Paul admonishes us to, or teaches us to admonish those who are idle. You know, it maybe seems like a little odd thing to throw in here, but, but kind of forget about, it's not, Paul's not talking about a political position or He's not concerned about economics. We as a church of Jesus have goals that we need to accomplish. We've got stuff we need to be doing. We have hills to climb, challenges to face, obstacles to overcome. And so we need everyone pulling their weight. You know, we, it's, it, we, we need, you know, when, when you do tug of war, you got to have everyone holding on. Even if, you know, even if you don't feel like you're doing that much, the last thing you need to do is just let go of the rope and not do anything, right? Well, we as a team, we all got to be pulling and, and uh, pulling together. And so uh, w this is talking primarily, I think, really about church, that we got to, you know, 
where we're, we, we kind of maybe have to get out of a little bit of an American mindset of that we're just consumers, but we've got something to add. And the church, we need, right? The, the way the world is today, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily a good or bad thing, but it is a bit of a challenge. And um, churches all over the U.S., in different parts of the world, they're really thriving. But in the U.S., it's, it's kind of a challenge in some ways. And so we really need all hands on deck right now. Uh, that's not just here. It is here. But it's kind of across the U.S. We've got we to gotta come together. And I think, you know, frankly, I think a lot of churches are kind of, we sort, sort of see that. And I think, you know, I'm not saying that we're not doing that. But that's the right sort of attitude to have is to be working together, to be pulling together. Because if we're not all pulling together, we're probably not going to get anywhere. <laughs> you know, we, it, it's a challenge to do it even when we're all working together. But it's really not going to work if we're, we're not in this um, together. And so we got... Um, you know, we've got to be working together, and, and everyone, we need everyone to pull their own weight, you might say. Um, and, and that doesn't mean everyone's doing the same thing, or that you need to feel guilty because you're not doing the same thing that someone else is doing. But we should all be, we can all do something. Uh, we can all help in different ways. Now, in all this, Paul, you know, he's, it, maybe you've noticed, Paul, it, it almost seems like, it, he, is he speaking out both sides of his mouth? He says, do this, then do this. Well, no, Paul is there's a tension here, and, it, and it's individual. You know, I, I think it's kind of neat that the scriptures, it's not like a, in this case, it's not like everyone do the exact same thing, but, but Paul's talking about how we're working together, and, and some people need this, and some people need that, and that's uh, important. Um, but whatever we do, Paul, and this is also a good correction, or good kind of tone to set, Paul says whether people need to be encouraged, or whether they need to be told to slow down, Whatever you do, be patient. Be patient with one another. Um, and that's a, a big deal with uh, teams as well. I, you know, maybe you've had this in, in sports or in music or in work. Some people are really passionate and they're really excited. And they're, they really want to be excellent. And they're bothered when they're not. You know, they're bothered when people around them aren't. You know, they're, they're naturally going to pull people towards being good. You know, I've had basketball players of all kinds, but I've had some pretty good basketball players, uh, you know, relatively speaking at least, and they, some of them are very, they really want to be very good, and they want the team very good, and so they won't, they, they, they try to pull the rest of the team in that way. Uh, but the problem is sometimes they're, they, sometimes they do it in a good way, but sometimes, like, oh, they're, they're maybe, they're just overly critical, or they yell at somebody repeatedly, you know, when, when, the problem, you know, especially when a problem is not effort, it's not somebody's not trying, they just need to work on honing their skill. You know, just hollering at them is probably not going to help them a whole lot. And you've had to have, again, that kind of conversation with players. You want players who are trying to pull people to be better, but sometimes you say, all right, you want to get better? Well, doing this isn't going to make us better. You know, we got to remember that we're on the same team. Don't pull, here's the key, don't make sure you're pulling us or pushing us forward not pushing us apart, um, you know, and, uh, you know, there's sometimes not a quick and simple, easy answer, but that's part of the patience thing, too. Even, you know, those of uh, those who are more, you know, energetic might get more frustrated with those who are timid, and those who are timid might get frustrated with those who are, you know, gung-ho and don't stop. We've got to be working together, and we've got to be patient with each other, um, and remember that we're, we're pulling in the same direction. Um, uh, then Paul goes on and uh, he gives us a list of things that we should always be doing. You know, continually doing these things. Not just, uh, all right, I did it once, it's off the, check it off the list and I can move on. Um, no, Paul tells us to be, to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing and to give thanks in all circumstances. Um, starting with uh, rejoice uh, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter how stinky your life may smell at this point. The truth is we can still rejoice, right? I'm sure some of us came in having a, had a great day, and some of us came in and we kind of dragged ourselves in this morning and we were not having a good day, but it was still refreshing, wasn't it, to hear, to be singing those songs and rejoicing and singing Emmanuel, Come, Come, Emmanuel. And that's part of what Paul's getting at, and that's why we have the music which really can help aid us in doing that. We're rejoicing. Whether we've had a terrible week or an awesome week, we can still come to the Lord and rejoice. Even if you can't rejoice because your life's been real good, the good news is 
Somebody, we can rejoice with others whose lives have gone well. You know, it doesn't mean we have to ignore or not address, you know, if we've got issues. But we can still rejoice with others, you know, and, that, and sometimes that really can help us when we're, we don't feel like rejoicing or we don't feel like we have that many reasons to rejoice. But then we get, right, you probably had this, you come to church and all of a sudden you're singing and, and boy, all of a sudden you feel a little better, you know. Um, and, and we always have some reason to rejoice, whether it's um, just the, the goodness of God and his promise um, to, uh, to be with us are sufficient reasons in and of themselves uh, to rejoice. And then there's pray continually. Now, I think one thing you want to be, I don't think Paul intended this to be in mostly a burden. You know, it, I mean, it's not like we have to have our hands folded 24 hours a day and we're sinning if we fall asleep, you know. That's not really what Paul's talking about. But he's just talking about being continual. It's not just a one time, but continuing to pray. And it's not just a Sunday thing, you know, but any day that ends in Y, right? There should be some prayer. And that's why a really practical thing to do is just have a devotion, a daily devotion, um, because it really can help. When, then you, when it becomes a habit, then you're not even thinking about it. And I would think that's, you know, there's room to grow, but that's sort of continually, because you're doing it every day, every day, and you're not even thinking about it, and all of a sudden you're reading a devotion, you're having a prayer, or, you know, those little things. Those are, those are there's a myriad of ways to do it, but that's one way, is just to have a devotion, you know. Uh, it's a good thing to have our prayer, you know, for, to pray. You know, we, we try to pray before meals, and sometimes it's a good reminder to me, I need to say, wait, I just invited Jesus to come sit down with me. What would he say about what I'm saying, you know, or how, well, the tone I'm using, you know? Maybe I need to, you know, be a little more patient, um, you know? Uh, those, are, those are good reminders, good ways to, you know, and there's a lot of, a lot of ways to do it, but prayer is important, you know, and, and I think in our own lives, if we got God to be coming, we got to be, in our lives, we want to be talking to him, if we want God to be working in our church, then we should talk to him about it. We should ask him. We should ask for his help. Um, uh, and then uh, give thanks in all circumstances. Um, is your life going good? Well, great. You know, give thanks. I know for me sometimes it's easy when life is going real good, when it's smooth. I, sometimes I don't take time to, on my own to, to give thanks. But remember, if your life's going good, you have, you have reason to give thanks. You know, there's, it's, not just a, it's not just an accident, and it's not just by what you've done. The Lord is good. And any good thing we've got, ultimately, is a gift from Him. And so there, if, if life is good, give thanks. If life is not so good, we can still give thanks, right? Because we can give thanks that if we are struggling, we're not struggling alone. Because God is with us, and, and uh, you know, as a church, we can have other people. There's other people, I pretty much promise you, if you're struggling, there are people who will... There are, you know, they can't fix all your problems for you, but there's people who will hear, who would be willing to be with you, to help you, to try to help you out, you know. Um, and that's, it's good not to be alone, and so we can give thanks that we're not alone, if nothing else, that we have our Lord and, and Savior with us. Then Paul says a couple other, again, this is kind of a both ends of the spectrum. He says, on the one hand, he says, don't, don't squelch or don't, you know, punch down the Holy Spirit. Don't put a lid on the Holy Spirit um, just because you don't understand it completely or it's not something you're experiencing doesn't mean that God can't be working in that way, right? Um, now, on the other hand, he says, test the spirits too. You know, so there's some discernment and just because something sounds pious doesn't mean it's really true. Just because something sounds religious, well, I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there that sounds good that gets said from different places, including from pulpits, and it's really not very good. You know, maybe some of it's just, you know, kind of inaccurate, but some of it can be kind of, can be not kind of, some of it can be damaging to faith. You know, so even, you know, certainly can test anything I say and test it up against the light of Scripture, and maybe, I, and I'm sure, fortunately, I probably said things wrong before. <laughs> not trying to, but probably have. Um, and so test it. Test what, make sure it's, it's good. Again, I think of, a ba uh, in basketball, most players that come to play basketball, they have some things that they're, they're good at, and there's some, um, again, at least I coach uh, the age group I got here at church is more 7th and 8th and then high school, 
And so a lot of them are somewhat familiar with the game, and they've got some good habits, and some of them have some bad habits too. But most of them have some good things that they already bring to the table. And as a coach, my goal is not just to bust everybody down and just mold them. You know, you would be a terrible coach if you did this. Try to make everybody the way I want them to be. Um, but you, gotta, you want them to hold on to what, what, the, what their advantages, but also to help them improve or hone their skills and to get better at, at other things. So you don't want to lose what they bring, but that's the point of coaching. That's the point of being on a team is to work and get better at, at a variety of things. And I think that's a pretty good attitude for us to have when we're coming to our Lord, to whether we are always aware or acknowledge it or not. Right? We've, one, we bring things to the table. You know, the church, we need, we the church need you. On the other hand, we, the church, also need the Lord. We need God's help. So not only do we, it's not only about what we can bring, but about what he can teach us, how he can mold us. And so we are like a, a, a good employee, a good player, a good musician, whatever it may be, is ready to learn, knows that they have room for improvement, they want to do better. And that's kind of our, what God, that's a good approach when we come to our Lord, too, is that he's, there's going to be some times where we have things we can improve on. Um, we've got um, uh, a, a lot that we uh, want to accomplish, but we want to be striving towards uh, the goal, that, uh, to use Paul's language from elsewhere, striving to, to go to the goal that God has called us heavenward with in Christ Jesus. It, there's a place we're going. We're going somewhere, and, and uh, we're going to be working on things. We're going to be improving. Um, and uh, we have uh, a lot to accomplish, but we've got the, the best coach of all time. I would probably, you know, my honest assessment of myself as a coach is probably I'm, you know, average. <laughs> I'm an amateur coach. I'm not, I'm not a great coach. But if you have a really good coach, and even with an average coach, uh, but it's, you're going to get better if you come to practice because a coach is, even if you're not intending to do that much better, a good coach is going to, work on you, and, and you may not know what's going to happen next. The, the player may not have any idea what the plan is or what drills they're going to do today, but a coach, even a halfway decent coach, is going to have some sort of plan and is going to have ways for us to improve. And, and as our viewing Jesus as our life coach, I want to use that, um, he certainly has a plan. And what's more is he knows, he's not just a good coach, he's like a Kellogg's Frost and Flakes great coach. He knows exactly what we ought to be doing and how to get there. And so, um, you know, sometimes it's, you know, I, today we're trying to focus on, there's a lot of little things, a lot of different things in the game plan, but we want to end with this, that God knows what he's doing. You know, we may not always see everything. We may not always just like, not every time you do a drill, do you do it perfectly? Not every time that you're trying to do something in practice does it go perfectly right. But God's got a plan, and he's going to take us there. And the most important thing is just that we're leaning on him, that we're listening to him, and we can trust him. He, he knows what he's doing. He's going to get us to where we need to go, and if we keep listening to him, um, things, are going to, things are going to turn out just fine. Um, and what's more, we know that this is where the analogy breaks down, is that our Lord isn't there just coaching. He's not just trying to get something out of us for one, you know, an hour of a game, but he, he wants the best for us. He loves us. You know, he... he he sent his son to die for us. We know that he cares about us. So it's not just about what we can do for him. It's really much more about what he's done for us. And now having known that, knowing that, uh, we, we want to share that good news. We want to grow. We want we want to follow where he's leading because he's leading us to somewhere good. Uh, we, we've all got flaws, but he's faithful, and he'll get us to the finish line. In Jesus' name, amen.